wow everyone with your speaking voice? Download The Speaker Coach on your favorite podcast platform. Hi everyone, this week is Sports Week on Live with Lisa and I was dying to know when I was getting back into a stadium and what are the athletes doing to be game ready and we packed the week with guests who would share the behind the scenes in the world of sports. In light of the events happening in our country and around the world, when Dr. Jen Welter and I talked about our conversation for today, we turned to chapter four of her book, Play Big. There we go. I want to read just this piece. We have to embrace, not fear our differences. My football family was and continues to be the most diverse and wonderful family. It includes men and women I've played with and against here and abroad. It includes the people I've coached and been coached by, tackled and been tackled by. My football family is made up of people of every shape, size, creed, color, and sexual orientation. It's made up of people who embody all of those things that can divide our society off the field, but that unite us on the field. And in football, diversity is strength. A team does not win if we all look the same. I thought that was terrific and a great way to start today. So let's bring Jen up. And Jen was the first female NFL coach and with the and the uh, first female coach of Madden NFL 20. Jen, you were, have a decorated career in women's professional football, which includes four world championships, two gold medals as a member of Team USA, eight all-star selections, and you were inducted into the first class of the Women's Fo Football Hall of Fame. You're also the author of Play Big, which I just shared, the creator of Gridiron Girls, and I love this. You received the Women's Entrepreneurship Day Pioneer Award in recognition of your achievements in the sports world. So thank you for being back on with us today. Jen? Jen? I don't know if Jen knows she's live. Jen, do you know you're live? think I'm going to fly here for just one second. Well, Jen, <laughs> you're live. Oh, this is interesting. We have to figure out if Jen knows that she's. <laughs> I'm wondering if it's not seeing her for some reason, which would be odd. So one of the things I was so excited about to talk about today is how diversity has played in with sports and how she has brought that to what she does. I hate to keep everybody holding. I'm just wondering if my tech team can work with Jen to make sure that she knows that she's on. So if you've been watching all week, we've had several guests. We started with Markel Blount earlier this week where he talked about his experience from being a Metco student who bust out of the city of Boston, out to the suburbs of uh, greater Boston into the to Metro West area. He talked about what it was like to be a student in those schools and grow up with that privilege. That's what he truly thought that it was and go on to be a football player with Boston College. He talked about how sports really helped him identify who he is as a person and realize that we're all equal. Though he did share some really interesting stories about the behind the scenes of off the field. Who did you sit with at the lunch table and how can diversity be a bigger part of who we are and what we do? I was really fascinated. Uh, Mark has been a really good friend of mine for a long time. And he talked about navigating sometimes a very not diverse world, but that his he felt he took his experience from sports and having no excuses as his piece in life and that he does everything that he can to move forward despite uh, having differences and he embraces the diversity. Yesterday we had Mike Riley on and Mike also known as Sarge as a, a radio commentator. We were talking a lot about again, the behind the scenes and what you see in sports and how sports really brings people together. We also talked about the fact that people like having their heroes and they like having their teams they work with and look forward to. And so that by bringing sports back sooner than later, would that help bring people together? It's such a unifying, 
thing that we all have. Sometimes it's by location. I happen to be a Patriots and a Red Sox fan, Celtics, and I look forward to them coming back on and watching and rooting. Um, but we're missing all of these pieces right now. And we talked about, is that part of the challenge? Is that people are missing their heroes, they're missing their interests, they're missing their hobbies. And when something horrible happens that creates opportunities to protest in peaceful ways, people can go the wrong way with it and create violence and destruction that is actually so harmful to everyone and what again brings us back on. So what I'm hoping is that when Jen does get on, Jen can talk about her experience being a female football player. What did that mean to be part of a, a group that was told they couldn't do it and part of a group that didn't think that they would um, be able to be seen and heard? And then as she became a coach for the Cardinals, for the, for the guys going to accept having a female coach? And as I read her book, it was fascinating to learn about how she looked at everybody individually, how she looked at everybody through, uh, let's say, through their eyes. And as she was looking at them, she could help them identify what their strengths were. I often in the office will relate to sports because I was an athlete growing up and not everybody can identify with sports, but we can all identify with something going wrong. Recently, I gave the example of when Tom Brady throws the football to Edelman and he drops it. I said, does Brady look happy when it happens? He doesn't, but it's not personal to Edelman. They jump back into the huddle, they re-strategize, they go again. And what types of lessons can we learn from that as a team as we go forward? Um, I'm really hoping that my team can, if you could just excuse me as I text to my team to find out what is happening with Jen. There she is. For some reason, she is not hearing us. And of course, we had no problems leading up to the broadcast. And we were all talking and chatting and they <laughs> brought us off to start the lead in and here we go. And again, this is the wonder of being live. If anybody does have any questions, they can certainly start them in the public part of the chat and share uh, with us the number, uh, excuse me, share, share with us what your questions might be for when Jen gets on. And uh, let's see, my team is, Let's see, messaging me also, bear with me. One second. You're saying watch Lisa Dap dance. <laughs> um, let's see here. I was so excited to have Jen back on today. She was actually our sixth episode way back when we first started this, way back when we thought, we'll do this for a few weeks. We'll see how it goes. We'll bring some really interesting people on who can inspire us. The first time Jen was on, she talked a lot about setting a new course for yourself and a new pattern and that chaos comes from not having a pattern in your day. And so what we did was talk a lot about what is your new pattern and that you could create a new sense of center if you put yourself as a priority, that you put yourself on your list as a priority and then created a new pattern for yourself. And as you created new patterns, working from home, working through Zoom, talking to people, Jen, that with that, Jen, can you hear us? Let's see. That in, whoa, no. in front, no, she can't hear us. Well, isn't that interesting? Um, hold on. The thing is we have a host chat where we can chat with one another here, but what I did know was that in our first episode, when we talked about creating those patterns, how many people have said to me since then that they have put themselves on their priority list, that with all the other things they did, they put the things on that they needed to do. 
Can you hear us now? Yep, I can. There we go. Well, let's see. I've been talking all about the book. I've been oh. talking all about our first episode. And Jen, I can't tell you how many people talked to me about putting themselves on the priority list after you're on the first time. And that thinking through patterns and what your patterns were in the day was such a, it seems like common sense, but what was such a great piece of advice and people getting a new a new thing going with their day. So unfortunately yeah. you couldn't hear in the intro, but I read the, I had the book. Yes. And I read the first part of chapter four. Yep. And as my guests know, I really, I go through these books. Okay. Yes. We have our highlights. <laughs> but um, I read the first section about yep. embracing and not fearing our differences. And I would love for you to talk about how this really changed your ability to coach by embracing the differences and where did that start that you learned that? You know, football taught me that. I, I, I always say I have like a deep love of football for so many reasons, but like it, in terms of diversity, to me, there's no better place to see it. When you look sure. out on the football field, you can see that there is every make, model, shape, size, creed, color working together. We have everything from straight muscle to straight hustle and a whole right. lot of crazy, I would say crazy, working together to um, do very different things in a fully choreographed dance of what it takes right. to be successful. Right. right. We have to see that people are different and not say, oh, we don't, we don't see that you're different. No, it's like, ooh, you're different and you're going to do this, which is amazing. Right. Like we, we love it. And so what that requires is, you know, you see it in the combine, right? Like at the combine, they are testing at these different things right. to get to know it. So we can put you in the best position possible. Right. And so if humanity looked at the value of individual vantage points in the right. same way that we in football look at individual physical characteristics and skills, sure. you're a whole lot better off. It's not like it's a bad thing that you're different. No, you see the same situation from your background, your perspective, and then you bring that voice to the table. And for me, you can't coach somebody if you don't know them. Right. Well, you talk about that, that you look into their eyes and you really get to know who they are. So how do you do that? And how would we do that in our personal lives with people that we know? The first thing is to take the assumption that a leader has to have all of the answers going in and throw it right out the window. Mm -hmm. Okay, you may know where you need to get your team, right? Like, let's say if it's a football team, I wanna get to the Super Bowl. Okay, that I know. Mm -hmm. I know certain systems, I know certain plays, all of that is good. But mm -hmm. all of those things are executed by real people. And right. so to lead them, you want to get to know them. Okay, what what leadership style did, do they respond to, right? Mm -hmm. is, is this somebody who needs high fives and hugs or do they need to just be left alone? Right. Um, and is there one day that's going to be different than the next? Mm -hmm. What does this person respond to in terms of the environment that they maybe learn best in, right? Are they a playbook guy? Are they a film guy? All of these things you can get to know through conversation. And sure. one of the things that will help you in helping people to do what they need to say on the field and whatever field that is, is to know them as people. Because sure. if your life, right, whether it's your marriage at home or your baby or something that's going on in the world, is mm -hmm. taking your whole mind out of here, then we should talk about it. And if I can help you in that stuff and bring you to a place where you're able to now refocus, we're going to be a whole lot better here. I would say yeah. it's very easy for me to coach a technique for a player once we've talked about his life. Because right. if they trust me enough to bring me into their world, then that doesn't stop when you get to technique. So sure. we can lead to the extent that we can walk a mile in somebody's shoes or play a game in their cleats. Mm -hmm. So, so with that, 
you talk in the book about sports is about the best player and judgments are based on skills. That is so true. There's nobody in this country or in the world who questions or doubts that in any way. Mike Riley was on yesterday talking from sports broadcasting about how people are missing their heroes right now on the sports field. They're missing that camaraderie of rooting for people. How do you think this all relates to what's going on right now that's leading to not just un, un, when I say unfriendly protests, but violence and looting and things like that? How does this all relate and what's the message that we can learn? You know, in sports, it's this unique place, right? And you just said it. We miss right now that place where we can put aside the rules of society and mm -hmm. completely live through champion somebody else, right? right? Where else do you see grown men taking their shirts off and painting their chest, right? <laughs> and right. freeing themselves to just cheer and to just like live in the emotions of that moment. The good ones, the bads, they, they cry, they hug, they handshake, all of right. these things, right? to people they don't know right? because they're wearing the same color, right? right? And yet there is this, this beautiful humanity that comes out when some of the like rules of the everyday office are taken away. And mm -hmm. we really do get to see the human spirit mm -hmm. play out in front of us, right? Sure. We get to see, you know, victors and, and losers and, and heroes and the enemies and all of those things. Mm -hmm. And we get to feel through it. And right. for so long, because we've been not being able to connect, right? Right. right. Because whether it's social distancing in your house, I mean, a Zoom call is great, but a hug is not even comparable. I mean, we can do this all we want, but mm -hmm. it's not the same. Right. And taped things, you know, we know the outcome to an extent, mm -hmm. right? You, They're fiction. So you don't get to really give up that same amount of control. And mm -hmm. now all of a sudden we have taken a true villain story, right? Like we all, I, I don't care who you are, watched the breath go out of a human. And you can't watch that and not feel your own chest collapse, right? right? If you can, right. then I probably don't want to know you because- right. I felt it. I, I got chills to a visceral level. And I think everybody who has felt like they couldn't get out and they couldn't connect. And, mm -hmm. you know, the heroes that we usually champion, which a lot of the times are sports, have been mm -hmm. also sidelined. I think right. it got people up and active and emotional in the one place that they could move the needle. And right now that's humanity. Right. So we learn that this energy needs a place to go. And <coughs> bless you. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless, bless Many you. Many firsts you. today. <laughs> but, but so we've seen that energy that it needs a place to go. Mm -hmm. Now what we have to make sure is that the, the voices and positive energy keep the momentum and keep gaining support. And those people who would use this as an excuse to do what they wanted to do anyway, in right. terms of, you know, whether it's destruction or rule breaking are not given the airtime and the free reign to do it because we can't separate what positive protests and change are versus mm -hmm what just using someone's death and, and the mourning of a nation um, as an excuse to do whatever you want to do because right. it detracts from the message and it, and it fractures people. Nobody can argue with the fact that uh, George Floyd and his family need and deserve justice and that our society is hurting and that we all have a voice and a place that we can add to that. We just need to make sure that the energy and the momentum stays um, in, in what the family has honored it uh, has asked for, which is, you know, peace and justice. Right. I right. heard his brother say yesterday, it was like, you know, peace on the left, like justice on the right. 
And, and mm -hmm. with the piece, you have a much more cohesive demand for that justice because nobody mm -hmm. can just break you down and say, oh, they're just doing this to as an excuse to X. No, right. we, are, we are together. We're protesting. We're marching. We're lending our voices to a move towards justice. So thinking about the camps, you have over 30 camps now for young women and they are learning football. And mm -hmm. that's not still typical of a young woman to be playing football, right? So that's a that's a diversity in itself. That's being different. What are you teaching these young women? What are you therefore then teaching parents and young men, right? As part of acceptance of them loving this sport that they're going to carry on, that these lessons will help with everything that's happening right now in our world. I tell the girls that the camps are about confidence through football and mm -hmm. teaching them that there's no game they cannot play and mm -hmm. no field they do not belong in or on. You right. don't have to love football. This may not be the sport for you, but mm -hmm. you deserve the right to try. And right. to, if you love it, to play. And mm -hmm. then if you want to play, to be coached and to be pushed, to not mm -hmm. just be okay or she's good for a girl, but you deserve mm -hmm. access to learning and the desire to be great because then that's what any of us wants. And, and that feeds really into to diversity is that we don't just want to be a token. They don't have to let you play. Right. But when you're good, they will find a place for you. Right. And that's right. when I always tell them like, let your game speak, let your game speak louder than your gender louder than mm -hmm. your detractors, louder than your haters, louder than your doubt, any of those things. Because mm -hmm. when you're good, not everybody will accept you, but somebody will absolutely want you and find a place for you because right. they're not they're not tied to the old way of thinking. They want right. to win. Right. They right. Want to win. Right. Right. Ryan on the side here said he's interested in your process for dealing with adversity. Um, sometimes it's embracing, um, what I like to say, like my brand of crazy, right? Like, I, I think I've done things for so long that people call crazy, right? That if somebody's not telling me it's crazy, I probably don't think it's worth doing, right? right. It's almost like this mentality of being able to do the impossible is right. so like enthralling to me. Then I'm mm -hmm. like, wait, what do you mean? Oh, okay. So, so you just told me why this wouldn't work. First mm -hmm. of all, you just gave me some of the over the objections I'm going to have to overcome. So thanks for that. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you just gave me some secrets. So this is why it wouldn't work. Okay. Well, they won't do this. Great. So if I can find an answer to that, I'm closer to where it wants to be. Right. But where I find the strength to deal with adversity is all of the people that I have fought with or fought for, mm -hmm. right? I think that there is a strength in what we like to say, like I like to say, and even the title of the book is play big, right? Mm -hmm. Playing for something bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. If it was just me and it didn't matter to anyone else, right? To my team, to my family, to mm -hmm. my community, would I do some of these things? Probably not, right? Mm -hmm. Would I... Would I run into and block a woman three times my size if my teammate didn't need a hole behind me? No, I wouldn't, right? First of all, I'd go to jail. Second of all, I mean, there's just no reason, right? But to protect her, I would do it a thousand times over. So I think mm -hmm. for any of us, when we might not have the strength as an individual, we can find the strength for something bigger. And, you know, whether it's, your football team, whether it's the goal of the team, whether it's the love of the locker room and the people in it or mm -hmm. your faith and whatever that faith is, but the ability to see that you're part of something bigger and that mm -hmm. we're not just, we're not just, you know, flailing in the universe and getting lucky, but that you're a part of a grand design 
Yeah. Then you know that, that you are going through it to come out better for it. Mm -hmm. Jen, would you share how tall you are? Uh, five foot two. Right. I am five foot two. I remember reading when I first read that you were five two, it really stopped me because I thought personally of how much I self selected myself out of mm. because I'm five two. Right. I made a joke the other day. Somebody made a, it was a metaphor about Lisa doing a jump shot. And I was like, Oh wait, hold on. I've never done a jump shot. You know? <laughs> but, but I, in my life in sports and in different, different avenues, I self selected myself out because I was short and, right. uh, and I've worn four inch heels. Everybody, no one ever realizes I'm that short until they see me without my heels on because I've always had a four inch heel on. Yeah. Um, where did you get that? not even just strength, that just sort of wherewithal that were like, I'm going to be the, one of the top football players in the world uh, because I just am. Where, where did that come from? Because I would love to know and, and share that with my kids. Well, you know, I will tell you, and, and this is something about me that anybody knows, like most people think that I'm big because they see football. So right. I meet people all the time and they'll be like, oh my gosh, you look like that coach, but she's a lot bigger than you. And I'm like, see, in my mind, I'm XXL. Right. <laughs> you better just go ahead and get me a small. And for, you know, I was the one everybody said what I couldn't, shouldn't, and wouldn't do because I was so small. Thankfully, right. what I didn't do was let them be right. 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 And when I got into football, it's interesting because, you know, it's like you want to be big. There's this idea that big is, is better in football. And it's actually not the truth. It can right. be, Right. But leverage is one of the most powerful things in football. And mm -hmm. it took me a long time to realize that I wasn't going to outbig anybody, even mm -hmm. though I was strong. I wasn't going to outbig them. And right. I was losing my advantage by running high. Right? right. We say in football, if you're high, you fly. That means somebody else yeah. can get underneath you and win. Right. And then one day it kind of shifted to me. Like I wasn't going to outbig anybody, but I could out little. And mm -hmm. I'll fast them. And right. once I realized where my advantage was, and it mm -hmm. wasn't in being big, it was actually in being little and being fast. And I didn't fight against it because I had an idea that I should be big. <laughs> and I owned it and fully owned it in every yeah. sense. And I mean that both in how I physically played and mm -hmm. also how I played off how I played. Mm -hmm. That's when I became great. And like, I would do little big things right mm -hmm. within the game. Cause thankfully I was getting my master's and then my PhD while I was playing. So I would try things out. Right? Right. Like I would be my own Guinea pig. Like, Oh, I wonder if that would work. Right. <laughs> and I would make sure, for example, like if I tackled somebody, I was always going to try and tackle the big girl. Right. And get up first. Mm -hmm. And then, Hey baby, do you need a hand up? Cause I'm going to be here all day. Right. And they like, they didn't know if I was nice or if I was just really not bright yeah. or if I was a whole lot crazy, but I would do those things that you don't really see to yeah. keep people off balance. Like I would blow kisses at people. I'd be like, Oh my gosh, I love your quarterback. I'm going to see your next play. You know, like, and I was loved and hated at the same time. Right. And all of those things that I did in terms of, you know, even the way of not smack talking, smack talking, yeah. into this this welter is small and she can't be stopped she's kind of like an energizer bunny and right. so I really created this kind of persona on the field that ultimately I had an international reputation of being crazy yeah. and funny enough I still do um in a lot of the things that I've been able to accomplish in the world but mm -hmm. it really is like learning to look at yourself mm -hmm. and not not judge yourself based on what someone else has mm -hmm. but really finding the things about you that yep. make you uniquely you and loving them right i used to i used to be like you and i would always wear the tall tall heels and you know what it's so funny now now i seldom do now i wear yep. a lot of flats cuz i'm like i love being short like it's it's part of who I am. And it doesn't mean I won't rock heels, but I don't feel like I have to. Um, right. I hear you on that. I mean, I, I do have 
such a collection now that I love that I, I wear them because I love them, but I know right. what you mean. When you feel like you get to your point, right. Where you're like, I'm good. You know, and it, it just gave me a thought because I think about uh, people are just talking about even getting back to getting their nails done and their hair done. And we've all gone oh this time without yeah. our hair. And before that never would have happened. We never would have let those things go. No way. And now it's just sort of like, you know what? We're still that smart and that good and that fine. And we're all laughing a little bit about our roots and all these other pieces, but we don't need these superficial things to be part of who we are in our accomplishments. You know, when, when you're on the field, I think also you have this psychology background. So not only are you practicing it, you're learning it at the same time. Something that really made me think, because we talk about this at my office, and I want to relate this to general business and to people who don't play sports. Coaching up, to be happy and thankful, it's a privilege when someone's coaching you up because we see your potential, be concerned when we're not paying attention to you. My team, I'm sure they're watching, I say that all the time. Yeah. Be worried when I'm not paying attention. <laughs> and and there are some people that really don't like being coached up. Talk to me about the psychology behind that. I think I think the first thing is really like having the honest conversation of letting them know that like the greatest gift I can give you is to make you better. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell the girls that in my camps, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I really discovered that um, when I was with the Cardinals and it was a conversation with Marcus Golden and, you know, he was an outside linebacker. I really saw something in and he had gotten chewed out one day and it was for a mistake I had made many times. So I yep. felt his pain on every level and I just watched his face drop and he hadn't yep. done anything specifically wrong. He was just way too close, close to the quarterback and, you know, hi, hey, that's not good. Right. Right. And, the reason that he had gotten jumped on was because he was going to be needed that year. And right. I just pulled him aside and I first coached him on the football aspect. He's like, okay, you know, thanks coach. And I said, Marcus, do you know why we're so hard on you? And he said, no coach. And I said, because you've got it. You're right. good and we're going to need you. And we're going to need you to get there fast. You don't right. have to worry when we are focusing our attention on things in the play that you can do better, the second you have to worry is when we're not talking to you because right. then we've given up. Then we right. know you're topped out. Right. And I remember Bruce Arians walking up on that conversation and he later asked me, like, he was like, man, he was listening to everything you said. Mm -hmm. What were you saying? And I said, well, football wise, exactly what you said. And I said, but I told him, you know, the best go gift we could give him was to make him better. Right. And that he never had to worry while we were coaching him up. When mm -hmm. he had to worry is when we get quiet and BA goes, oh, yeah, man, then he's cut. Good job, coach. And he walked away. And I just went. And I remember saying to Marcus, like, I wish that I had I had looked at being coached up mm -hmm. like that when I was a player. Right. And now I know it because I'm a coach. Right. And I didn't have that a lot of the times in my career because mm -hmm. I had played a lot longer than a lot of the players, especially at certain points. And mm -hmm. if you have people who are brand new, you're a lot of the times having to focus on the bottom up. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to get somebody up to speed really fast. And they're like, oh, well, she's good. But she's good enough. And I now look at it and I think, but that's not fair because how good could I have been if I was never allowed to just be good enough? I was one of the best in the world. And mm -hmm. a lot of the coaching I got was coaching I sought out for myself. Mm -hmm. Imagine if I would have had every coach who I played for care about me to that extent. Mm -hmm. And that is the level of care that I try to bring to all of my players and they know it too. I'll be like, man, look, you know, and whether it's the girls at the camps or the guys in the NFL, like I feel for you and it's my job to give you everything I've got. Mm -hmm. And if you know that I'm giving it to you from that place, I don't have to be perfect 
but I'm perfectly intended. And that resonates because people know that you would never lead them badly. So right. I think really it is establishing that love and care so mm -hmm. that you're clear. Like, mm -hmm. I love you and I want to see you be the very best. And I've played this game a long time or I've been in this game a long time. And it is my goal to build into you. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean it won't be perfect. And that don't doesn't mean we won't have moments where maybe as coaches, we don't say it the way we would like to, or we didn't have right. as much grace. Um, or that players don't always take it the right way. But if we have the foundation of a relationship, mm -hmm. then you know what? We can also go back and correct it. And I've done that many times of like, you know, I don't even like how I said that. That wasn't me. And I was frustrated about something that wasn't you. Yeah. And I apologize. Right. Mm -hmm. Because when you're willing to do that too, as a leader and mm -hmm. be a great human first, and that doesn't mean a perfect human, that means human. Right. Right. Then so, I think you have a lot more leeway. What about an example when someone still doesn't respond? So you're coaching, you're trying, they're just not buying what you're selling. What do you do, Jen? Not everybody is for you. Right. Right. And you and you have a whole team of people. And there are going to be there are going to be situations where for whatever reason somebody doesn't respond to you, or they might not respond to you on that day. Mm -hmm. This is where it is beautiful to have, number one, a staff of people, mm -hmm. because some people that respond really well to me mm -hmm. might not respond really well to somebody else. So right. they may have to say, like, coach, I need you to just talk to them. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, you're right, coach. I got it. Right. So mm -hmm. we as coaches need to realize that we are also not perfect and that mm -hmm. we have to be heard and everybody has a different communication style. So mm -hmm. there are certain things that, and I've seen it right mm -hmm. where there were players that I had that would not respond to another coach or hear something from me, maybe because of the delivery or mm -hmm. maybe because of who was delivering the message, right? Mm -hmm. That happens. And mm -hmm. so being willing to take your ego out of the equation and realizing that what matters most is that we get to where we need to be. Right. Mm -hmm. If somebody else has to tell them, great, you deal with them. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's on you. Mm -hmm. As a coach, you still convey the information mm -hmm. and you do it in that way. Also, if the person's being a jerk, there'll probably be a lot of player accountability and mm -hmm. setting a standard within your team of what's okay and what's not will mm -hmm. really follow that through. I have mm -hmm. had, I have had situations where um, and many of them where my players were my biggest advocates. Mm -hmm. And it might've been, it might've been a coach who was like that to me. And I've had that too, where they mm -hmm. just, you know, weren't used to having a woman on staff and they didn't like it. Right. And I remember I've had players of mine be like, uh, excuse me, coach, the hall of famer was talking. Right. And I'd be like, Oh no. Right. Like right. It just made it more difficult. But the standard that you set within your team, mm -hmm. um, is also one of those valuable things, right? Mm -hmm. Because players will see things that coaches can't, or they'll know certain elements that are detracting that mm -hmm. a coach might not be in the room for. And sure. so there has to be an organic um, team level. Then within coaches, we have to be on the same page as much mm -hmm. as possible. So whether right. they hear it from you or they hear it from me, they're getting the same message. The delivery might be slightly different, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully the voice you know, resonates or how they bring it out, right? Some mm -hmm. players just need to see it on the field and they're right. not going to get it on, on tape, right? Mm -hmm. So the method of delivery and the deliver, and then it's also true that there are some environments that are not right for some people. Mm -hmm. And I have had conversations with people before on saying like, I, I may not be the right person for you, mm -hmm. right? Like, and if, us working together is going to be detrimental to both of us. Then let me help you find a better situation. Sure. And I have had that conversation where I was literally like trying to fire a client before. Um, and it wasn't a player. It was a client. And the client was like, oh, my gosh, that that wasn't my intent at all. But I, was right. like, but I, I don't think you're responding to me in the way that I can be helpful so I'd like to get you somebody who can. 
Right. And then they didn't want it and didn't realize how I was interpreting things. And I've mm -hmm. also had people that fired themselves. Right. Right. So we have to be willing to try all methods, but also realize that not, not all, not all things are going to mesh. And sometimes right. being willing to say like, I will help you by not mm -hmm. keeping you um, right. can be one of the most powerful things you would do. Maybe mm -hmm. you're better on a different team within this company or maybe within a different company, but I don't, I I'm fighting for you, not right. fighting against you. So right. what do we need to do to get there? And sometimes that conversation in itself can be your best healing tool. Sure. And I say to people too, if you're having those conversations and they're hard, and, I, and I've said this to my kids, sometimes it's just the, the time and place. It's a place and time where this isn't the right space for you. Mm -hmm. And don't take it personally, use it as a learning opportunity. Maybe we pivot, maybe we shift, or maybe we even come back to it in the future. But at this time and place, you're not a loser and you're not failing. This is just not the right thing right now. And I think that's another lesson that people need in their toolbox. And Without again, so that they're not, act, again, I, then I go back to like, they're not acting out, they're finding solutions to challenges and, and bringing people together. You know, I, I thank you because we've been on long today because we got going a little late. Is there anything pulling this all back around, right? And I always think about tools in people's toolboxes, right? And sometimes people just don't have those tools and it could be because of experience or because they've never been taught it, right? I mean, you can't drive a stick shift car if no one's ever taught you how to do it, right? Yep. So what tool is most important for someone to have in their toolbox? Watching what's going in the world right now, whether it's COVID, whether it's diversity, whether it's injustice, what do you think is the number one tool that people can practice right now? Being a good communicator, Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's both ways, right? Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I don't claim to be perfectly empathetic when it comes to diversity. Mm -hmm. it, there is no way on this earth that I could understand everybody's vantage point mm -hmm. because I haven't walked that path. But right. I tell anyone, whether it's, you know, on the field or in life, like, if you will trust me enough to let me feel what you feel or, mm -hmm. you know, do what you've done or walk through your shoes, mm -hmm. I can always help you, right? Whether it's a player in a different position or a person handling a situation, but so much of what we're dealing with are misses in communication, Sure, right? Something was missed, right? Mm -hmm. I said something, you heard something else because of, either my background or yours, but for mm -hmm. some reason we missed each other. Mm -hmm. Right. And so instead of being quick to anger and the assumption that it was malicious, mm -hmm. right. Which is what we do when we're hurt. Right. Instead, can we talk it out and give people an, an, an opportunity to be better, right? right? Like to be better. And mm -hmm. Let's take those areas in our lives with things that we can control. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, especially in the COVID situation, which is so hard on so mm -hmm. many levels, every single one of us has a different element that we can control. We can mm -hmm. control in our house. You're controlling a part of being a good voice in the, in the world by doing what you're doing right now. Right? right. Like you even said earlier, it's not something that I thought I would do. And yet, this is a way that you're bringing hope to other people through mm -hmm. your sphere of influence and through your gifts and your connections, right? Mm -hmm. That's in your control. Right. Right. And so for each one of us, it's then finding the places and the spaces where we mm -hmm. can positively and proactively move the needle, whether it's COVID mm -hmm. or whether it's what's going on right now with George Floyd, like mm -hmm. not just, sitting there paralyzed and suffering in silence, but having right. communications and then finding ways that we can act, whether it's checking on a loved one and a text message, making sure, sure. that somebody in your house is okay, making sure someone in your business is okay or in your sphere or taking your talents 
and putting mm-hmm. them in a way that helps the world in your way, right? Your show is this. For me, that's been the kids' books that I've been writing, right? Like that right. was something that I could do to take what I know in psychology and look at an area of society that I didn't feel like was being communicated directly with or being given a voice, mm-hmm. right? And so to take very complex things and talk to kids about it was something that I've been doing in so many facets of my life. Mm-hmm. And I started writing and thankfully, like one of my really good friends, Brooke Foley, she owns a branding agency. She was like, this is really good. Now, mm-hmm. my my stories might have stayed in my notebooks if, right. if I didn't have someone with her depth and breadth of experience and the ability to help help bring them to life as she did with the characters and the illustrations, like sure. they might have stayed there. And mm-hmm. we all need those people and mm-hmm. those opportunities now and the ways that we can move the needle for other people. But don't suffer in silence. Find the ways that you can in little ways, right? Mm-hmm. Chip away at the psychology of every day because mm-hmm. Those things, they have a life of their own. And momentum is a very powerful force, both Mm -hmm. psychologically and physiologically. You know, this is a great way for us to wrap up because I often talk at the very end about the campaign we're working so hard on, put your money where your mouth is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I talk about like this dress is Denise Hajar's. She's a Boston designer. She's been a huge supporter of mine. And I always try and wear clothes that are designed, owned by women, bought at a women's store, because it's a it's a reminder to me that I'm helping other women just like women who helped me. And not that men do too, but we all have our lane that we choose. And this has been mine. And I ordered up my nail polish from you last yeah. week. And if I get one more notification that it's stuck on a truck, I was so disappointed. But as soon as I get it, I will have it. Could, so I think if people thought about their triggers, right? And I mean this in an actually positive way, what tr- trigger could you put in your life? Like I think about like, what am I wearing today? Oh, I think I put this on. I thought about Denise and I thought about how Denise has helped me in the past, right? Mm-hmm. And I put these earrings on and they're Stella and Dot and it's a stylist who I helped her entrepreneurial business. Yep. And if I wear the nail polish, what do you want people to know when they wear kit glass nail polish? Um, you know, it's funny. And so I have it on, I painted it when you said it, it's a top coat or you can put it on over any color. So it, it, it's cool. Cause it, it changes the personality, but the way I always say it is that like, I, I wanted women to know that they could have their hands in the trenches and their nails on point, right? We don't have to be just one thing. And mm-hmm. kick glass is, is literally what it sounds like. It's kick ass for women, right? right? Like glass ceilings, glass sidelines, the glass slipper mentality, Whatever that is that is holding you back, like mm-hmm. let's let's shatter it and break through to the next best level of self personally and professionally. And right. so, you know, I have my friends who are like, oh, I put kick glass on today. And that's that's what I wanted them to feel. And right. that's what it, it was designed to be. And that's what it is for me. And I do the same thing that you do in terms of triggers for women. Mm-hmm. Um, I have. Um, a really good friend who names Vivian Hugh. You would love her stuff. She's fabulous. Um, awesome. I, I found a dress of hers um, the day I was walking on the streets of Soho to like do my book launch party. Yeah. And I fell in love with it. And the last time I was in New York at New York Fashion Week, actually speaking for Visa, which, you know, of course, like you want to talk crazy, like a football coach at, at Fashion Week, right? Right. Speaking. Sounds like fun to me. Um, right. But like, hey, why not? And I had brought this piece of mine um, that she did. And it's like this half jacket, half sleeveless pink with these like, like green cockatiel. I mean, it was just so stunning. And I'd never had the occasion to wear it. And I brought it because I was like, fashion week is perfect. Right. right. And I, I went into her store just to check in. Um, yeah. And she was there and she had done her fashion show for fashion week earlier that day. And we both recognized each other because I tagged her in stuff and like she had seen it. And we were like, I was like, Vivian, she was like, Jen. 
And she ended up coming to hear me speak and I got to wear something of hers on stage and she brought her daughter and we spent a day just really like hearing and learning about each other. And Mm -hmm. those things mean so much. So for all of us who are struggling, pull those things out, right? Whether Mm -hmm. it's out of your closet or out of a drawer and put it on the wall, like set your environment up to have yep. those positive mental triggers. And also mm-hmm. I always tell everyone, get a theme song, right? You need many, right? Like for what kind of day it's going to be. One of my right. favorites is Aloe Black, I'm the man, because it has nothing to do with being the man and you can be yep. the man, even yeah. as a woman. Um, yeah. And all my players just do crack up. They're like, only you coach. And I'm like, Right. But isn't it right? And they're like, we have that on our YouTube. We've got the playlist that was created from last time you were on and people were sending us songs and we sent it out and then people could add to the playlist publicly. And so that was on our YouTube with me. Yes. And um, so, yeah, we're going to have to pop that back out because that's, that's really important things. They add up. Yes. And music can transform our minds. Right. And, and, if you weren't watching us the first time when we talked about this, the reason why I always bring up a playlist um, and those triggers is the power is this. Mm-hmm. Your mind can only fully hold one thought at a time. Right. So when you talk about resiliency or mental toughness, it's really your ability to shift your mind to where you need it. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean that we don't have those moments where we lose it. Um, right. But how fast can you get it back? And the beauty of music, and every time I say this, people relate to it because that concept can be tough, but I'm like, come on, tell me that song that you can walk into a room and be in the worst mood possible, but you can't help but be like, and then you even try and get mad about it. You're like, no, I'm in a bad mood. And then you're like, but I'm not. And that that is the power of triggers. So whether it's your friend's dress that... Like mm-hmm. you feel good to wear it and you think about all of those great times and connections that you've had or right. a picture that can transform you to a destination that you want to be in or sure. a song that takes you there. In mm-hmm. these times, especially when we're struggling with so much weight, fortify yourself by the environment that you create, both right. mentally and physically. Yeah, this is great. I hope that everybody who's watching this is liking the video because when you like the video, this will pop up all over YouTube. More people will see it. More people will share it. If you have not subscribed, please subscribe because we have more great people coming on too. And I'm sure I'm going to talk Jen into coming in in the future. And uh, and you're actually coming up on a summit that's coming up. We had uh, Pamela Bellotto on last week. She has a summit for military wives and Nickerson, because of this show, is now a sponsor of the summit. We will be working with Pamela to promote this. You're a speaker at the summit, as is Jazz Booth, who was a speaker of ours last week, and you introduced us to. I love the way this is all one giant circle of support. And uh, And when good people come together, that's what's possible, right? right? And Jazz has actually been out to my football camps. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have supported her at her events. And the funniest thing, of course, is, you know, Jazz is six plus feet tall. And then there's like, like her up here and me down here. And we're both like, yeah, why wouldn't we go together? Right? Like, um, and, and that's the beauty of it. And I think we will continue to expand on that and all of the things that we do. Um, and yeah, it's, it's going to be a great summit. Um, yep. Everybody should tune in for that. Military is really close to my heart. Um, because my dad is a Vietnam veteran. Um, oh, great. He is a veteran, um, a silver star and two bronze stars, um, a legit hero and mm-hmm. he formed my mentality. So that yeah. is, that is a place that anytime I can lend support for their heroism, sure. right. Which might be just shining a light on what they're doing. Um, right. I, I'm going to do it because, you know, again, we need to see, um, and connect with the the great people who are doing great things in so many areas of the world. Well, we'll put information about the summit in the messages beneath this video. If people have other questions, 
ways of getting in touch, want to know more, please put messages beneath the video on YouTube. We'll be back in touch with you. We'll put information about the summit up. We'll have a link to Jen's book. And Jen, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, we're back again tomorrow because it is, um, well, it's Thursday. <laughs> we're back on tomorrow. So anyway, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you again. See you again soon, Jen. You're so welcome.